the uh, issue of uh, a person wandering around uh, Western Australia in the sensitive areas with a mobile phone and the destruction of your, uh, your um, I can understand that both of the new side, or both of the, both of the proposed, proposed side, have that same problem. Yep. But my question is this. Uh, over, say, a 20 or 30 year period that uh, the SKM may operate, how are you going to stop the progress of uh, the Australian civilization? Impinging on that area, or the areas that keep around. Yeah. Especially wireless objects are starting to proliferate. Yeah, yeah uh, federal legislation. So that, that whole area is uh, protected under federal legislation so that you can't actually build or introduce any new significant uh, radio transmitters into that area. So it's, it's what's called a, a radio quiet zone and is protected as such. So that's. Yeah, so that's ex ex that's exactly the um, so so these areas before people will spend a billion dollars building something for radio astronomy, there has to be uh, legislative protective protection for that for that area. So both Western Australia has that, and, and South Africa site has that as well. So th there, there exist lot. Well, there's a hundred people there now. They have homesteads, and <clears throat> there are public roads. Um, so there there is interference, but um, we're able to define buffer, buffer zones around various bits of infrastructure. So, for example, 10 kilometres either side of a road, you couldn't build a, an antenna. So you can, you can build the antennas far enough away that the, the interference drops off. So we produce a mask of the area that has go and no-go zones, and we build the telescopes in the, in the go zones. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, there's someone with the microphone. I believe that confers precedence. Last time on TV, there was a program on SKA, mm -hmm. and um, it was very interesting to listen to people from South Africa yep. complaining and um, uh, really pushing the point of the fact that we are a very poor country and we need this for our economy. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the main issue of their mm -hmm. want for SKA. Yep. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's sort of, yeah, maybe so, but it's not that. Yeah, well, that's, that's the card they've chosen to play. And the only reason they do that is because it has a fair chance of working. Uh, so, so in Australia, we're very strongly focused on building the best possible instrument on the best possible site. So there's an evaluation process underway. And whichever site comes out technically and scientifically, the best place to build the SKA is where it should be built. Sorry? Oh, I'd have to be honest and say it's, it's difficult to say. Uh, there are many factors that are being evaluated. Um, but it doesn't matter how many technical and scientific factors that you consider, sometimes uh, subjective factors are, uh, come into account as well. But I don't, I don't think it will be a, a big consideration. When people are spending a billion dollars, they're usually pretty rational. Who decides? Yeah, good question. So um, at the end of this year, uh, an international organisation comes into existence called the SKA Program Office and its job is to spend the 90 million euros for the design process. Those 90 million euros come from, as it stands at the moment, eight countries and each of those countries will then have two delegates on the governing board of that organisation. Those delegates will decide. Right. So that's going to be, that's going to be the... the uh, the ultimate uh, selection committee. There'll be a number of recommendations through uh, the evaluation process, but those uh, documents end up with that governing board. They've paid the money. They've paid for the right to make that decision. It's their money on the line. Question here. Uh, 
Yeah, according to my understanding of, of all of this, and I stress again, I'm not an expert cosmologist, but, but yes, that vacuum energy increases. That's about as much as I can say. That, that appears to be the case, that the energy is constantly created out of the vacuum. So this is the problem. Physics has always told us that um, these things are always a zero-sum game. So if nature is different, then we need to explain that and revise our physical laws. So it is a, it is a bizarre scenario if you're used to physics. But you know, special relativity was bizarre. Quantum mechanics is bizarre. It's just the next bit of bizarre physics, perhaps. You've, you've said that uh, there was uh, several towns in the um, African uh, micro area. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had a chance to have a look at the noise floor figures that they compared to our site in Australia? Uh, it's um, part of the evaluation process. So a uh, very important part of that process is to test the RFI environment. So <coughs> they built a test rig to go and measure that. And that was deployed in Australia for a number of months to make measurements. Then exactly the same equipment was deployed in South Africa over the same number of months. So all of the data exists. I haven't seen it. I've seen little bits of it. Um, but yes, that data will be evaluated. Any differences in the interference will be um, uh, you know, discovered. And that will be taken into account when uh, this group of people make their decision. It'll be one very strong factor. Um, I assume you need to minimise the amount of interference that comes with the technology that you bring in with the SAA, yeah. things like the, the motors to move mm -hmm. the, uh, the dishes that you've got. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering what is, what's the biggest thing that brings in interference and how do you deal with it? Yeah, really, really good question. Um, so self-generated interference from the instruments uh, can often be the, the worst offender. So, um, so you need to set, set uh, stringent specifications on uh, what interference that you are, are allowed to self-generate. So I can't reel off the name of the relevant spec, but it's, uh, it's mil spec whatever. It's a military specification. It's, it's very, very stringent. And um, anything that goes up to be installed on the site needs to be tested in a lab and proven to have emissions lower than the mil spec numbers. That, that's actually a very, very um, difficult thing to do um, and takes a lot of time to appropriately shield all of the equipment. So for example, some of the equipment we're sending up for the Murchison Widefield Array is just uh, doing its final stages of testing in the lab. and. Um, yeah, you have to pay a lot of very careful attention to make sure that you don't uh, spoil the site just by being there. You, you said that um, the, two, the choice of the location of the SKA was between Australia and Africa. I've actually been there, I've spent quite a few months there some years ago. It's a colourful place, an interesting place, an adventurous place, and a time of dangerous place. So wouldn't the Australian site Uh, the, the formal evaluation follows scientific parameters, technical parameters, and geopolitical parameters. So those sorts of things are factored in. So, yeah, the evaluation will consider all sorts of things. The cost of labour in the two countries, 
um, the availability of skilled workforce, um, security, all of these sorts of things will be factored into the decision. All of the, there's, there's about five pages of factors and each factor has its own weight assigned to it. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is yes, that, that all of these things will be looked at. Are there any arrangements put in place for the sharing of data? Sorry, where are we? Oh. Um, radio astronomy has traditionally followed what's called the open skies policy, which is regardless of who's paid for the instrument, the resultant data or the access to the instrument is open to absolutely anyone. So regardless of who pays for it, uh, typically it's been the case that all they've asked in return is for people to do the best science regardless of whether they paid for it or not. And so it's a sort of reciprocal thing amongst the countries in the world that you know, we use facilities in the US for free and US people use facilities in Australia for free. That paradigm has shifted a little bit in recent years. Um, I don't think it's fully decided how it will work for the SKA, but I suspect given the countries and many of the individuals involved, it there will be a very strong push to keep that open skies policy. Are there any advantages over a, um, a north-south axis, or I would say an east-west axis over a north-south axis? Yeah, that's a really good question, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, so I've, I've, one of the things that I've been involved in is designing the uh, remote station configuration, and it's definitely the case that an east-west configuration has advantages over a north-south configuration. And that's because if you make an observation over a number of hours, the rotation of the Earth gives you a better result for an east-west array than a north-south array. It's a, it's a pretty technical consideration, but it's, it's true that east-west is better. Yeah, I'm going back to the noise. To what extent can that be um, made not noise by um, by having a, a deterministic signal so that you can then subtract it from? Does that come? Kind of yeah, there's um, a number of different ways that you can deal with interference. So, of course, the best the best way is not to produce any interference at all. Um, but when the data is being processed, whether the signals are deterministic or not, there are certain uh, signal processing techniques that you can use to remove the interference from the data. As long as the interference is not so strong that it overloads the, the, uh, the uh, RF analog front end components of the, of the telescope like the amplifiers. As soon as you drive the system non-linear, there's nothing you, you can do. If the instrument's working within, within its sort of uh, linear dynamic range, then there's a lot of things you can do in the signal processing afterwards. So first thing is minimise the interference you generate. Second thing is put into place these signal processing uh, algorithms that allow you to remove the interference from the data before you make an image. Yeah, uh, I'm interested in the sensitivity of the antenna array, maybe if there's three of them that go through the sites. What's the difference between the zenith and down to the horizon, and what is the area that it might cover? Yeah, so that's also a good question. So the dishes can point in any direction. So the dishes to within um, about 10 degrees elevation can maintain full sensitivity all over the sky. The, um, the aperture arrays that sit on the ground and are non-steerable suffer from a projection effect. So if your object is at zenith, you get full sensitivity. And um, as you're looking at objects closer and closer to the horizon, you're flat at the zenith. You know, you're getting the full collecting area. At 45 degrees, you're getting the projected part of that area, 
and at horizon you're getting nothing. So your sensitivity varies as a function of the elevation of the object that you're looking at. Um, but it varies predictably and you can always design sequences of observations that keep you close to the zenith to maintain uh, full sensitivity. Australia, what proportion of the celestial sphere will it be able to see? Yeah, it'll see, uh, let's see, it'll see to about plus 30 declination with some sensitivity. So that's most of the sky. Except for most of the Earth. Yeah. yeah. The really important thing about being in the Southern Hemisphere is that the uh, centre of the Milky Way galaxy passes overhead. So initially there were four sites considered. China, uh, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Australia. And a big point in favour of South Africa and Australia is that they're at latitude around about minus 30. So the galaxy goes straight overhead. So obviously the biggest telescope in the world should be able to see our galaxy. So the Northern Hemisphere is not much good. Pretty technical questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when you find the whole stuff to pick up, where are you going to aim at that point? First place you want to look at. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, to do some of these cosmology experiments, it doesn't matter because every direction you look, you see the universe. Um, Probably the very, very first observations will be looking at some part of the sky that's very well known. So we can first of all make sure that we're getting the right answer out. And um, having gone through that acceptance phase, um, the telescope will be scheduled to do lots of different things and can possibly do many different experiments simultaneously. So you might be searching for pulsars at the same time that you're mapping the hydrogen in the galaxy and the same time that you're um, doing cosmological observations for dark energy. So it's one of the really nice things about uh, the instrument is that you can po probably simultaneously run quite different experiments. Does it make it a she? Does it make it a she? Um, <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs>